Hello, um, I'm going to cover the properties of ionic compounds and go through some of the demonstrations and practicals we do in this section. So if we recap ionic compounds, they happen when a metal and a non-metal element bond together. The metal elements lose their outermost electrons the non-metal elements gain those same electrons. This electron transfer happens to give both of them full outermost energy levels. And it creates, through electron transfer, it creates ions. So, ionic compounds are composed of ions. And the ions have full outermost energy levels. And the ions are charged. The metal element forms positive ions and the non-metal element forms negative ions. <coughs> the most famous example, sodium chloride. Now, I've, I've dealt with this via the theory videos, so this is more about the practical and the demos. So, this is cubic. This is a small teeny weeny bit of the smallest crystal of salt, sodium chloride, that there might be in the world. Because these ions, that ion I'm touching in the corner, the ion there, they're tiny. They're just the size of atoms, which are tiny. And so ions are tiny. In the smallest grain of salt, you've got trillions and trillions of atoms. So I want you to picture a three-dimensional framework of positive and negative ions alternately arranged the positive, negative, positive, negative attract each other. Those attractions outweigh the repulsions where positive, positive, negative, negative might repel each other. And so we get something that is stable. The attractions outweigh the repulsions in total within any ionic substance that we've got. Now this ionic is a bit uh, good because within the five by five cube, We've got a three by three cube in green. You probably see that if I move it around a bit. And that is the cube we normally draw. We normally draw a three by three cube, but it's only part of a bigger structure. This actual structure needs to be millions by millions by millions for it to be representative of the smallest of our crystals. <coughs> and obviously we can't make models that are millions and millions big. This is something it's going to have to do. So these little straws, they represent the attractions, the electrostatic, the electro, I can't say it, I'm sorry, electrostatic attractions between the positive metal ions and the negative non-metal ions. <coughs> Those positive negative ions attracting that is an ionic bond. And where we've got those electrostatic attractions, it's ionic bonding. So this is ionically bonded, sodium chloride. That is chlorine, that is sodium, that is chlorine, sodium. Can you see? It alternates green, gray, green, gray, and so on. Green, gray, green, gray, and so on. Green, gray, green, gray, and so on. In three dimensions, the, the pattern continues in three dimensions. Now, I don't like these straws, never have, but they're the models we used to make. Now there's a better model. Yay. So a few years back, our department spent about, I think it was about 160 pounds and got this. That is a three by three. And the larger ones are the chloride ions. So the chlorine ions are, are the green ones. The sodium ions are the blue ones. Why is that better? Well, watch. There. It's magnetic. And that is more reflective of an electrostatic bond. An electrostatic bond is one that attracts. Like that. You see that attraction? I love that. Three by three. Look. Take that off. Take that off. These are ions that are separate, look. Those ions are separate. 
and those ions will alternately arrange into a three-dimensional cubic arrangement. Now that sodium chloride, I want you to, to kind of have this image of positive, negative, positive, negative ions attracting like this magnetic model shows. Not like this model. This model is okay, it served its purpose. This is the better idea I want to leave in your young minds. I want you to think ionically bonded, the different ions, the positive and negative ions, attract each other. And that magneticness, the attraction, is far more reflective, far more accurate. And I want you to have that picture in your mind's eye whenever you're talking about ionic bonds. So, whenever we have a compound that's made of a metal element joined to a non-metal element, you'll get this kind of situation happening. There'll be electron transfer. You'll get positive negative ions. The positive negative ions will attract. And you'll get a three-dimensional lattice formed as a consequence. Now, those bonds that you get are strong. They're strong bonds. And I'm talking about the electrostatic attractions are strong bonds. They're strong electrostatic attractions. I'll keep saying this word strong because it's a fundamental point I want you to, to have in your heads. Ionically, ionic bonding is strong. The attraction between positive and negative ions is strong. There's an awful lot of it within any ionic compound. And therefore that strength of the attractions should manifest and we should see it in our world in the properties of ionic compounds that we come across. So there's a few other little demonstrations I want to do. Let's just flip my camera around. <coughs> right. So one of the demonstrations is this one. Uh, it's in a fume cupboard because it's going to hopefully give off bromine. See that? Uh, what I need to do is explain it to you and then start it cooking. So here we've got power pack, positive and negative leads coming out. The positive and negative leads go to two electrodes and the two electrodes are connected to a bulb. Now, if I have an ionic solid here, this is lead bromide. That ionic solid, believe it or not, is solid. And being solid, the bulb does not light up. Look, the bulb is off. The power pack is on. Yet the bulb is not lighting up. That is because solid ionic compounds do not conduct electricity. The ions are not free. The ions are vibrating in their places. They're not freely moving about. So how can we get those ions to move about? Well, we get them to move about by putting that Bunsen burner flame underneath and lead bromide should be meltable. So it should be able to melt with that Bunsen burner. The Bunsen burner temperature is about 450 degrees and I don't know what the melting temperature of lead bromide is, but it's less than that. So, as it melts, what do you think will happen? Now, it will take some time to melt. I might have to come back to it and I can show you a different demonstration in the meantime. But that, when it melts, then the ions will be free. And there are only two reasons why things conduct electricity. Either they have free ions, or they have free electrons. Now, in ionic compounds, there's never any free electrons, because they're always in their energy levels. But if I melt, if I melt this, then I will have free ions. If the ions are free, then the bulb should light up. Conduction of electricity will happen. And just as a by-product, which is why I'm doing it, look, I'm doing it in a Bunsen burner. Sorry, 
I'm doing it in a fume cupboard that lead bromide, when the electricity goes through it, will make lead and bromine. Now lead is relatively safe, but bromine is very dangerous. So <coughs> when it melts, when the bulb comes on, I'm going to get the switch and I'm going to switch on the fume cupboard suction like that so that any bromine is carried away safely through the roof of our school rather than coming into the lab and uh, causing some kind of hazard where we might breathe it in. You never ever want to risk breathing in bromine. It damages lungs irre irreparably. So, if I come back to that, I come back to that when it's cooked, when it's melted. Ah, actually, I can see the bulb coming on now. That was, see the bulb? You should have seen it come on as I was talking to you. I was almost walking away and it came on. So, fume coming on. Now it's a bit loud that fume cupboard. I'm going to take the Bunsen burner away. I know it didn't look melted, but the bottom of that beaker was melted. And I've taken the Bunsen burner away, so it's fairly safe now. I can even put the, the cupboard down so we can look through the glass. Watch the brightness of that bulb. As the lead bromide liquid that's at the bottom the melted lead bromide turns back into solid and solidifies or you might use the word freezes then can you see the brightness of the bulb goes down as less and less ions are freely moving about in that beaker as there's less and less ions freely moving about in the beaker then the electricity flowing through that beaker will get less and less until there you go the bulb has gone off because the lead bromide has solidified and when it's a solid it doesn't conduct electricity so liquids ionic liquids conduct ionic liquids conduct but ionic solids do not conduct ionic solids do not conduct because no free ions ionic liquids do conduct because then there are free ions when it's a liquid now, carrying this idea on further, let's just put that on a yellow flame before we move to two other demonstrations. Let's switch it round. So, switching it round to show you this apparatus. Let's get the thing down. I've got a power pack here. I'm not sure you can see that very well actually. Power pack. Power pack. And I've got here some sodium chloride. So look. Sodium chloride solid. That's your household salt. And I put it into a beaker. And I've got two electrodes. I put the electrodes into the solid and connect them up with some wires over here and a bulb like this. One more lead needed. I need another lead. I'll show you in a minute the circuit. There's the, the lead. Sorry, I thought I set this up before, but I didn't. Yeah. Right, so I want you to see. Let's just switch around.
I want you to see here power pack the live and neutral wires coming out the live wire here connected to one electrode the neutral connected to a bulb via a bulb back to the power pack to complete the circuit see turn it on it's on the bulb is not on because the solid does not conduct electricity now you could argue melt the solid so here I've got some salt same household salt I put it in a boiling tube just to get a bigger test tube for you to be able to see it a bit more clearly and I'm going to get a Bunsen burner and I'm going to try and melt it there we are Bunsen burner trained on that try and melt it now one of the things we teach you is that ionic bonding is strong believe it or not I would have said that a few times earlier to reinforce the teaching point and if the attractions are strong then it, they're not going to be easily overcome if they're not easily overcome then if we don't overcome them the solid will stay as solid so ionic compounds have very high melting temperatures can you look the bottom of that test tube is getting red hot yet the salt is not melting in any way because its melting point is so very high I think it must be a little above 450 which is roughly the boiling temperature of that Bunsen burner one of the things you should know is melting temperatures and boiling temperatures of ionics are very high so we cannot with a Bunsen burner melt it I can come back and show you that later but I don't think it's going to change and no matter what I do to this solid here I can't melt it like like I could the lead bromide it's never going to conduct but what I, I would like to do is get some water now here look beaker and this is water put some water how can I free up ions without free up ions without melting it well there's a, a simple way this is salt that's water put some in there what if I dissolve it what if I get salt and water and make salty water now that will make what we call a salt solution sodium chloride solution the solute is sodium chloride the solvent is water I'm hoping some of it's dissolved even if it's not all dissolved and now if I get that solution and get the apparatus see that that's the same apparatus I had before take it out no conduction in the solution it conducts look at that bulb coming on nicely so I want you to picture here ionic solution the ions have broken off the three-dimensional lattice that we had and the ions are freely moving about and because they're freely moving about that's why the conduction of electricity happens and the bulb is on so solutions conduct solutions of ionic compounds conduct electricity because they have free ions solids solids don't conduct because the ions are not free same with that one solid does not conduct when you melt it it will conduct and we talked about melting points boiling points the melting point boiling points are very high look 450 degrees of a Bunsen burner and that salt is still a salt even though that test tube is glowing red hot underneath final thing do they dissolve well you know sodium chloride dissolves in water sodium chloride there sodium chloride here water here 
that in there will make salty water. You know we can get salty water. It's called, it's called brine in the English language. But salty water everyone knows about. Salt dissolves in water, salty water, or brine. And I want you to know that many ionics do dissolve. And when they dissolve, they break up into ions. Look, that's why that bulb is on. Because they break up into ions. And if they don't dissolve, then the attractions, the ionic attractions within the solid are too strong. Not always will an ionic solid dissolve. If the attractions are too strong, then the water won't break them down. If the water doesn't break them down, then those ionic solids will not dissolve. So a lot of ionic solids dissolve, but some don't. Uh, in year 10, we give you a solubility table where we tell you what kind of chemicals dissolve and what kind of chemicals don't dissolve. But three properties you need to know about. So, electrical conductivity I've dealt with, melting and boiling points being high I've dealt with, and whether ionic solids dissolve in water. Right, that's the properties of ionic compounds. I'm going to stop it there and move on to covalent compounds, but I need to set up my demonstrations before I record that. See you later. Right, okay, welcome back. So, now I'm going to deal with ionic, sorry, not ionic, covalent compounds. Um, covalent compounds, if I take you back to how they're made, when two or more non-metal elements, this is when non-metal elements come together and they join together. I'm sorry, I think, I think I'm getting a cold. <laughs> Um, when non-metal elements come together, they have to share electrons in order to get full outermost energy levels. They can't transfer electrons like as what happened with ionic bonding. So their sharing of electrons creates a covalent bond. The sharing of two electrons, a pair of electrons, between two different nuclei. That will bind the two different nuclei together. I mean, my, my analogy for this is quite simple. I normally get a pupil standing up, and they've got one hand, they stick their hand out. Another pupil stands up, sticks his hand out, and I ask them to hold and share their hands. So they have to hold hands, and that holding of hands, that pair of hands, binds the two pupils together. It's that kind of thing. It's a, it's a very physical way of bonding, covalent bonding, and covalent bonds. I want you to picture them like that. So the most famous example is this. This is water from the tap. So, I mean, tap water is not pure, but I mean, I mean, just imagine, imagine that's pure water. And pure water will be made of molecules of water. Now, what are the molecules of water looking like? Well, they're triangular. Can you see? They're triangular. And they're moving around. And they're moving around rapidly and randomly in all directions. I've talked about all of these things before. I've got a model to show you. That is one water molecule. I'm holding the hydrogens. That red ball is supposed to represent the oxygen. Can you see it's triangular? People call it angular. Some books call it bent, because it's not straight. I call it triangular. Or V-shaped. I like the description. It's V-shaped. V-shaped. Um, those molecules, like that, are what water's made of. But the molecules are tiny. You're not going to see them with your eye. There are in 18 grams of water. And here you've got more than 18 grams. You've got like three times as much. But in 18 grams of water, there's more of these molecules than there are grains of sand on Earth. It's quite amazing just how small atoms are and 
atoms, like these atoms, they come together to make a molecule, and that's a molecule. And remember the definition of molecule I gave you? A collection. Collection of atoms, look. Collection, collection of atoms, that collection of atoms covalently bonded together. So three atoms here, three atoms covalently bonded together make a molecule of water. And you can have other examples. That. It's got four bonds. Valency four. Four bonds likely to be carbon. <coughs> the white balls are hydrogen, carbon, four hydrogens. That's methane. That is the gas that's in your gas taps. That's the gas that your boiler at home will run off gas when it runs on, on gas. That. Blue ball. Three bonds. That will be nitrogen. Nitrogen with three hydrogens is a famous chemical called ammonia. So, collection of atoms covalently bonded together. You might like this one. I like the shape of this one. It reminds me of a poodle. But it is, in fact, carbon, three hydrogen, CH3. Carbon, two hydrogen, CH2. With an oxygen and a hydrogen, OH. CH3, CH2, OH. That's ethanol. That is your alcohol that is in your alcoholic drinks, ethanol. So that molecule, collection, collection of atoms, two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen, that collection is a molecule of ethanol. So molecule of ethanol, molecule of ammonia, molecule of methane, molecule of water. I want you to learn that when you have covalent bonding, you end up with molecules. So with ionic, you get ions. With covalent bonding, you get collections of atoms covalently bonded together known as molecules. And so the word molecule is used a lot because out of the nine or so million chemicals documented, about eight and a half million of them are covalently bonded. Covalent bonding is the most common type of bonding that we have. And therefore, all over, you use the word molecules. And if you read news items, they use the word molecules incorrectly. They say, oh yeah, the molecules in sodium chloride, salty water. Well, salty water, the sodium chloride is ions. It's not molecules. The world uses and confuses chemical terms and it annoys me. I don't want you doing it. You're doing GCSE chemistry, get it right. Use molecules for covalent bonding. Collection of atoms covalently bonded together. And use ions for ionic bonding because there you've got positive and negative ions. These molecules are not charged. The molecules are all neutral. Right, okay. If, let me just disconnect this. I think I must have uh, hit a button and lost the, uh, the recording there. So I've, I've started again. I'll try and put the two recordings together. Um, here I had water and low toxane as two different layers. I wanted you to know that in covalent bonding, mostly the covalent compound does not dissolve in the water. However, there are famous exceptions. Look, that's water. This is alcohol, ethanol. That's covalent. And when you mix the two, this time, you do not get two layers. Look, you get just a mixture where water and alcohol do mix with each other. Now, when you're older and you're year 12, we discuss why we get dissolving and why we don't get dissolving. But the ideas to introduce to you now would be a, a little complex. And so we're going to leave it till later. So, mostly dissolving. Covalent things don't dissolve in water, but some do. Um... Having got the dissolving out of the way, then 
melting points, boiling points. I think this might be uh, a time to do something which is not good and I don't want you doing it but because I'm alone in the lab then I might do it for you look I've got here I've got here some alcohol which I put in the bottom of that test tube I've got a Bunsen burner which I can light and get a flame And I can heat up the alcohol with the Bunsen burner. Now, that is called bumping. When a chemical bumps like that, it's bumping. But more than that, I should be able to light the gas that comes out of the end. So there we have alcohol being lit by the Bunsen burner. If I keep more alcohol turning to vapor, then I can turn it off. There, the alcohol easily turned into gas. And unfortunately, or however you want to look at it, the gas, alcohol vapor gas, was flammable. And you saw it catch fire. And that's what we don't want to happen in a in a classroom situation you don't want to risk having a fire uh, and certainly when you have a fire you don't run away from it you just deal with it so the final thing now is electrical conductivity and i'm using that same apparatus do you remember the one i used with the ionic compounds i'm using the same apparatus and if i get a spatula and if i short circuit the Positive negative. You see the bulb, I want you to see the bulb coming on. There. The bulb comes on when there's electricity flowing. The bulb is working. What I need to do is to put something in there. And what I'm going to put in there is a number of things. Let's try ethanol, alcohol. This is 95% pure alcohol. Put it in. No. The bulb does not light up. So ethanol, alcohol, does not conduct electricity. Okay. Let's try um, low toxane. Low toxane. Like petrol. Will. There you go. That's low toxane. I'm sorry, I might not have had the camera in the right place, but I put low toxin in there, and the bulb there has not come on. And finally, let's try water. I'm just going to fill up the beaker with a bit more water than I had before. And the water. Surprise, surprise, the bulb does not come on. Now, these three compounds, alcohol, low toxin, and water, all of them are covalent. They are made of molecules. Remember what we said about things conducting? They only conduct if you've got free ions or free electrons. You certainly don't have free electrons. They're in the energy levels. And you haven't got ions. You've got molecules. So these things do not conduct. The difficulty is some people say, But sir, water conducts electricity. We know water conducts electricity. Well, yes. It only conducts, not because water's conducting. This is the salt from the ionic bonding experiment. If I put salt in there, now can you see that bulb? The reason water conducts is because of the impurities that are within it. The dissolved salt or if you get tap water, there are dissolved things in tap water, they conduct. It's not the water. Water is a non-conductor. Let me say that again. Water is a conductor. 
Water does not conduct electricity. And don't be lulled into a, a false chemistry where you think it does conduct electricity. It doesn't. So the three properties. Number one. <coughs> dissolving. Most common things don't dissolve in water, but some do. Number two. Melting points, boiling points. Melting points, boiling points are very low. They turn into a gas very easily. When they turn into a gas, you can often smell them. So organic chemistry is, is full of molecules and people know it as a smelly kind of chemistry because the chemicals turn into gas very easily. And finally, conduction of electricity. This one. The conduction of electricity happens not with covalent compounds. Covalent compounds don't have ions, they don't have free electrons, they never conduct. Indeed, the only time that they will conduct electricity is when sometimes, when we're making acids, we get a gas, look, we get a gas, hydrogen chloride gas, and we make something called hydrochloric acid by dissolving the gas. The gas is covalent, but dissolving in water, the water and the gas react together and they make, hyd they make acid, hydrochloric acid, which, believe it or not, there you go, the bulb comes on and lights up because the solution has got ions. This has got ions of hydrogen and ions of chlorine within the bottle. There are trillions of these ions. Those ions are in there now as the acid and those ions are conducting the electricity. That's because there's a reaction between the covalent gas and the water that makes those ions. But otherwise, covalent things don't conduct. Solids don't conduct. Liquids don't conduct. Gases do not conduct. Only some solutions of covalent compounds conduct. Right, I'm going to end the video there. Okay, take care lads.